Up next, panel discussion. Topic, Future State of the Union. Search in database for panelists. Panelist 1, Liza Borches, President of Carter Myers Automotive. Panelist 2, Mike Stanton, President of the National Automobile Dealers Association. Panelist 3, Steve Greenfield, Founder and CEO of Automotive Ventures. Panelist 4, Damon Lester, President of Lester Automotive. Assigning host, Carl Mancia. Collaboration loaded, Q intro sequence. We got, we're going to talk about AI sometime, at some point in this. We figure we bring our own AI, you know. <laughs> we got a little Connie up there. Can, so. I, can, I, can I ask her a question? Yeah, and, uh, well, you could. Can, you know, we have, a, we have someone on our team, Al. He's always like, we can. I don't know what the result would be. <laughs> the, the answer, we got, we got a prompter. It says the answer is yes, yes, you can ask her a question. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, thank you so much for uh, Liza, Damon, Mike, and Steve for joining us here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the not too distant future. Uh, so we're, we don't want to get too far over the hills with talking about what the future looks like for automotive because seen over the past couple years we almost can't predict tomorrow uh, the way that auto is working right now but um, just want to give an overview of what these incredible leaders are seeing from their positions uh, at, at a, at a mid-sized dealer group a single rooftop group and uh, from NADA and from uh, Steve's seat understanding the VC space as well as just the, the general space uh, of, of what's going on in the global world of automotive so um, thank you all for, for for joining me here really appreciate it i want to start with liza um these chairs are just terrible so um so i apologize for that fall. yeah <laughs> liza, we fall, liza we can't meet the, okay <laughs> my legs are a little too short for the chairs there we go uh so uh you know liza as you're looking into the next couple quarters as we go to q4 and then into quarter one of 2024 um when, when you're looking at the horizon of all the things you could be thinking about for your dealer group and for the people that you're working with, what are some of the trajectories that you're pointing at and, and, and purposing toward to make sure that the store stays successful? Well, before I get into that meet, I just want to say at some point a few quarters from now, I'm looking forward to being back with this group because when I walked into that reception last night, you all at the Asodu community have done an incredible job of bringing together like-minded and like-hearted uh, dealers, vendor partners, everybody in our community, so ah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, when we look forward, and when you first put together this panel and said three to six months, my immediate thought was, well, I don't know if that's future State of the Union. But then you look back three years, and I don't know that we could have predicted even three to six months in advance much of the past three years. So. Three things that I'm going to share today, I think there's, uh, between all of us, we could probably fill a full day of potential things that need to be focused on. But first, we're all starting to see the inventory dynamics change, right? Certain brands, we're starting to see more inventory on our lots. We're starting to see gross profits trend downwards, not overnight, uh, and some brands quicker than others. I think one of the most important things that we can be focused on is understanding how that's impacting our teams and our people financially and not waiting until that conversation is brought to us, but being proactive about it. Mm. So as we're looking at the way gross profits are changing, how inventory dynamics are changing, we need to be understanding, we all know that our sales associates have sold fewer cars and made more money than ever before. And when, when their financial situation starts changing, they start looking for greener pastures. And I think if all of us leave right now and go home and identify who are the absolute key top people on our team that we want to make sure are part of our team, not just three and six months from now, but three and six years from now. And we need to be looking at all of the layers that we've had the grace to create the last three years. We've added teams and vehicle upgrade and sourcing vehicles, and we've added people um, we've added things to our tech stack. We've added more BDC associates, sometimes an extra manager here or there. When we look at our average cost to sell a car, it has gone up with the average gross profits going up. We need to understand the true cost to sell a car, prioritize what we want going forward, create pathways for our sales associates and managers to be able to make the same money they've been making, but it means they might have to be cross-trained, take on additional duties, increase their volume, et cetera. So number one, we gotta be proactive with the financial situation that's happening to our team 
and yeah. create paths. Number two, uh, we've got to start paying closer attention to the OEM programs that are starting to infiltrate those stair step volume bonus programs coming back. They're coming slowly and sometimes without you even noticing it. One brand that now has their uh, incentives or their uh, dealer money tied to sales effectiveness. Again, we were grandfathered for three years and overnight it impacted us $500 per car if you weren't 100% sales effective. Wow. So we got to start paying attention to that. And I would encourage everybody here to get on your dealer advisory boards, your retailer advisory boards, be a part of the conversation with our OEMs to find new ways to incentivize performance and not revert back to what was happening pre-2020. We got to be in those conversations. And the final thing I'll mention is around training. We've been talking for a year about we have to go back to objection handling with our sales teams that they haven't had that for a while. But specifically, we need to be training our teams on how to deal with the affordability challenge. We're presenting payments to customers that are sometimes three and $400 higher than anything they've ever seen, yeah. especially if they haven't bought a car in five or six years. So we need to be prepared to read that body language, to have our, our teams trained on what the different options are for customers who obviously may not be able to afford that in today's world. So that's where I'll start. Yeah, uh, Damon, you, you actually bring up a lot with Paul and I. You'll text us, you'll be like, hey, Remember the keyword affordability, right? Like that's like front and center for you. I think uh, both just in your demographic, but also um, because you're paying attention to it with uh, your, well, previous uh, role with NAMAD and now in, in a shifted role there. Um, how are you seeing affordability impact both the consumer and the dealer at this point and, and maybe some of the dynamics that are at play uh, with inventory struggles that are going to lead to greater affordability issues? For, for one, I would say first, from a dealer perspective, interest rates are high, right? It affects us too. So there's, there's, this, um, there's this sense of empathy that we have to have for the consumer to recognize that they too are affected by the interest rates as they try to purchase a vehicle. As, as Liza mentioned, everything's we've been in this, this fluctuation of people have been living on this very high from an income standpoint, their lifestyle changed two, three years ago, and now we're kind of down to like, oh, this ain't right type thing. And so <laughs> we, we, are, we are very cognizant of it, um, but interest rates affects our bottom lines. Um, and trying to find and figure out the true cost to sell a car is, is key um, for us as well. But from an employee and, and personnel standpoint, the grosses are lower. The volume has to be higher, but the access to the volume has to be key as well. And so there's no balance in the force right now. And so what we're, what we're trying to do is, is, in addition to volume selling on both the new and the used, we also got to pay attention to service. As Liza mentioned, there's a lot more incentives from the OEM from, from Nissan. It's more so coming based on customer service satisfaction or CSI scores. That has to be high, but you have the volatility. If a person can't afford the car, then you have, and you're not treating them with empathy, then that survey is going to be reflective of how they 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 were perceived to be treated. And so, we pay a lot of attention to 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 that as well as from the back end on service because that's key um, key for us to survive or key for all of our dealerships to, to survive at this point. Yeah. Uh, Steve, I want to move to you and I'm, I'm like seeing some threads here that we'll come back to in just a moment. But um, from your view in, in the technology space in particular, uh, what are you paying attention to and what are you seeing dealers having to really start to pay attention to and understand over the next year to be able to leverage technology well in their stores? Yeah, I think that um, it's an interesting time and I'm really eager to hear what Mike has to say about this. But, you know, we, we've seen this shift to electrification. I think in some cases we've gotten ahead of ourselves. And um, you know, the, the manufacturers have to plan in three, four year cycles. So they're already committing to retooling their production lines to create EVs where, where we're seeing there may or may not be consumer demand for some of these models. And I think as a result, we're probably going to see more incentives because dealers in some cases across some brands are going to have more EVs on their lots than they have consumer demand for, which you know must manifest then incentives to get rid of these either consumer facing incentives and or dealer facing incentives. Right, so I think inevitably we'll see more, especially on the EV segment, more mar margin compression. 
dealers will say, oh, my grosses are lower on these EVs unless they're being subsidized somehow with the manufacturers. And we're going to see, I think, uh, a tale of two cities. We're going to see higher day supply in general for EVs than we are for ICE vehicles, especially in certain pockets across the U.S., right? So to answer your question, one of the things I'm most excited about is trying to help dealers navigate through those sort of headwinds, my, my anticipated headwinds, and, and find ways to find efficiencies. And efficiencies um, are, are basically looking at my cost structure and saying, how do I help my current labor do more, right? Get more throughput, be more efficient. And I think that the, the, this, uh, I, it's, it's already um, talked about too much, but th this world of AI that we're entering really is going to help people become much more efficient automate a lot of the mundane automated tasks, right, the redundant tasks, and free them up to work on not, not only content, uh, um, as a pre previous presenter said, that's going to help them sort of self-actualize, right, find more purpose at work because they won't have to do these mundane tasks. But I think we're going to see a, a new wave of innovators that help dealers effectively look at their cost structure and through automation take a lot of those costs out. Yeah, I was. That's funny. I was actually talking to someone last night uh, that has a, a large consultancy and data uh, entity that's here uh, that was talking particularly about that. Like we have all of this data about what dealerships are doing, right? And right now it takes you know models that uh, like NADA or NCM have used for very long amount of time to kind of like figure out and then train against, and it takes a lot of human input. And now like AI isn't just for uh, chat bots and for writing uh, legal letters to your school's kid to your kid's school when you're mad at them right um, it's it can be a lot deeper than that in, in, in the use um, Mike there's been kind of two threads here one is this kind of return f from automakers to incentives but also this look that they're having toward EVs and and all of that is also met by the government and and there is like this triangulation that's happening having to deal with um, how do we deal with current like what's happening right now on the ground in stores what's coming with EVs how is the government impacting dealers consumers and uh, and um, the the OEM right uh, I, I want to kind of point to this then then uh, at, like look to you for a little bit more, but yesterday there was uh, an article in Automotive News where uh, there was essentially some some concern amongst a, a large group of dealers about just the the how the change in how incentives and how things roll down to them impact financial particularly their financial statements and their accounts receivable on potential large incentives heading into 2024. How are you, uh, how is NADA approaching just the current EV status in the U.S. and how that is working with the government? Well, well Kyle, first, first off, thanks for having me. And yeah. I, I heard, heard Paul's shout out that NADA needs to get more involved with what you all are doing. And I'm a big believer in that. We're going to figure out a way forward because you, you guys are, are, you're getting our attention and we've got a booth out there and we're committed to, to what you all yeah, are doing. Thank you. Um, and I love your, your saying, love cars more than people. This is a relationship business. Oh, oh I'm, that's right. Love people more than cars. The other, the other thing though is, is I was thinking it's Freudian it's, slip, right? Freudian yeah. slip. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Liza. Uh, but it's also one of, one of my sayings is just, and it, pay, it pays off. It's just easier to be nice to people. You know, Liza and I have known each other for a long time. I used to call on her dad, Damon, and we were counterparts, and now he's my boss, and Steve and I have known each other for like 15 years. So it pays off to be nice to people, and these are all, all trusted advisors. Um, I've been asked to give the regulatory update, and that's not a signal for you all to go to sleep because <laughs> we've got a federal government right now that's effectively mandating what we're going to sell down the road in terms of EVs, and then we've got the FTC that's going to tell us how to sell it. I mean, what could go wrong? Right? What could go wrong with that program? So in terms of EVs, you mentioned the tax incentives and they're too confusing. These numbers, you've got our manufacturers agreed to 40% by 2035, which seemed like a stretch to them, seemed like a stretch to me. Then they were told 50% if you want all the support, the IRA, the subsidies, the incentives. That seemed like a real stretch and the EPA comes out with 67%. I haven't talked to one person that thinks we can get to 67% by 2035. So it's a proposed rule, NADA has filed comments, the manufacturers have filed comments. We're starting to talk about things like plug-in hybrids, affordability, 
charging. We're getting in front of the customer. We got bureaucrats in Washington. We got politicians getting well out ahead of where the customer is, and that's a recipe for disaster. So why am I? I mean, I mean we, we need to be for something. I mean, dealers are. We're doing our part. We've invested over five billion dollars in, in getting ready for electrification. But you all, the dealers in the room, you're a big deal to to your lawmakers, and you need to tell them what's happening at your store, because you know, you you create the jobs, you provide the tax revenue, get them to your store, let them know that maybe it's not going as well as they think it might. So that that's that's an ask for help. And then in terms of the FTC and what they're trying to do, and I'm not talking about safeguards. Hopefully you all are on a path to complying with safeguards. There's some good vendors out there. I'm not talking about the enforcement actions, which are also very, very important that we make sure that we've got a consistent process in, in the F&I office. And NADA can help with that. Free programs, at F, uh, NADA, Fair Credit, Voluntary Protection, NAMAD, AIADA has supported that. It's just a way to start everybody at the same point and justify a discount. But what I want to focus on is the vehicle shopping rule. This rule, I mean, Lena Khan and her team at the FTC, they want to radically change the way our economy works. They're going after everybody, not just us. But what they've done, they've done again, these are very smart people that have gone to very good schools. They never made it out into the real world. They're bureaucrats. They're listening to a few complaints, and they're, they're already illegal, by the way. And we talked earlier about, about getting the bad actors out of the business because it, it, it hurts us all. But they want to change the way we do business with our customers universally. And we're talking about adding costs and adding disclosures. Again, thought up by bureaucrats in D.C. without input from, from business, which doesn't mean we've worked so hard with the vending community about NROEMs, about getting our transaction time shorter. We've improved customer satisfaction. They want to take us backward. So NADA is all over this. We've introduced an, an FTC Redo Act in Congress. What I'm asking for is your voice matters. You are the best lobbyist that we have, and, and if you need more information, I know it's hard to, you know, this, this stuff rattles right off the top of my head, as it should, it's my job, but we've got it all at NADA.org. We need you to, to, uh, to share your concern, because this is going to get us. We all see this train wreck happening. I want to make sure we look back and say we left it all in the field. We did everything we could to make our lawmakers aware that they're going down a very slippery slope right now. Yeah. Uh, Liza, especially in a large organization like yours, and obviously you have levels of management and, and expertise to drive uh, all of this down in, into your salespeople, but you're, you're going, hey, I have to work with, with my teams on object objection handling, and especially you're in Virginia, that you're not far from the news cycle of EVs and the FTC, and this is happening not just to your, your employees, but also to consumers. How, how are you navigating uh, this? <laughs> You're like, ask another question. <laughs> um, how are you navigating that education path to make sure that they're well, well enough aware of what's coming down the pipe in the future, here in the next one, two, five years, but also very aware of the current situation on affordability like you were talking about and the need to adjust maybe what their day looks like? I think that you're asking, you're looking forward around EVs. So I'm going to go, yeah. how are we? Sure. Yeah. How are you marrying a, like the two yes. conversations okay. happening? And there's, because there's a lot in that question, a lot of what Mike just shared that we can dive into other subjects, but specifically about, I think there's two different ways that we're looking at the future. One, we want to make sure that regardless of what product is on our lots, whether it's EVs, ICE, hybrid, or some other alternative fuel technology that isn't out there yet, we want to make sure that we're positioned to be the trusted advisor for every consumer in our communities because they're going to be faced with challenges and, and decisions around their transportation that they've never been faced with before. Whether they decide to go down an EV path, whether subscription or autonomous ever becomes a part of our future and they have to decide whether riding in a car is something they're comfortable with versus driving. We just want to make sure that our teams are so well prepared and educated and trusted that we are the people that they come to as they're trying to make these decisions. So right now, you know, we've invested a lot in educating our team around EVs. John Ellis and Bev Everything uh, has been one of our partners to, to help train our teams, do EV boot camps. Because while we're going to be talking to our government officials and legislators to make sure that there are smart decisions for the overall automotive industry and the consumers in all of our communities, we also are going to be prepared if this is the pathway we're going down. So our teams are going to be the trusted advisors. We are also going to show up at every legislative event that we can to make sure that they know the reality of what we're seeing in our communities. 
and that some communities are gonna be much more EV friendly than others. And, and, and there are different approaches than a one size fits all. Uh, we are all in on EV and we're gonna be talking to our legislators. So uh, Kyle, I think you know, there's a pathway that we talk to our teams about and then there's also work that myself and some of our other executive team do with NADA, with VADA and with our legislators. That's awesome. Steve, uh, uh, going back a little bit to uh, there was uh, both Damon and Liza pointed to this necessity for uh, teams to kind of get more dialed in on their exact role, but also potentially expand their role to create efficiencies as cost rises or people look for greener pastures. Um, how can dealers be educated on exactly how to create efficiencies? Because and, and I'll give like the real is. Oh, uh, well, okay, so I'm going to go to, I don't know, the expo hall back there, NADA in a few months, and there's going to be 83 new vendors, and they're all going to be extremely important. Um, and I also have all of this tech debt, and how do I align that and get, like, at, I can't imagine having been in this business 20, 30, 40 years, you know, I've been in it for 14 at this point, and be able to acquire all the knowledge of the historical technology and the new technology coming out and align a tech stack to actually create efficiencies without just having 83 tabs open in my dealership. What's the, how, do you, how are you encouraging dealers as you're speaking to them about aligning that tech stack? Yeah, so I, th I think we'll, we'll go into the NADA conference here first week in February, yep. right? Back in Vegas? Back in Vegas. Back in Vegas. Everybody will be there. We'll see you again. Um, almost every single booth will have a, a new product around AI, right? They'll probably call it AI or some derivative thereof. I would say practically the best thing is to start with your existing vendors, right? Before you go chase another shiny object, go to your existing vendors, find out what they're building, and, you know, make sure you align what, whatever your objectives are as a dealer with sort of what, what they're building, because ho hopefully there's, a, there's alignment there. If it is productivity per salesperson or, or whatever, whatever it is, I think we are, we are moving away from a world where for 15 years, you know, this, this acronym DISC doesn't sell cars. We're moving away from that now to, to really dig into like, you know, when Damon or Eliza are, are running their dealerships, what are they trying to achieve? And then try, trying to find alignment with the vendors to make sure that they're helping them achieve their objectives. So I would start there. And then if, if, if you know, you're sending those sonar signals out to your existing vendors and not getting the answers, that, then I think it's time to start doing some vendor selection. But you know, with, with, with going into NADA, um, you, you guys do a great job. There are thousands of vendors. It can be overwhelming. Being very crisp around what metrics you're trying to drive and then finding vendors to complement those metrics. But I do think that it's time for all the vendors in the audience to up our game and, and really have these intimate conversations with your customers to understand what's top of mind for them. Because we, we are entering a new era where we're gonna get back to, you know, um, margins that probably look a little bit more like pre-COVID than during COVID. And, you know, as a result, the dealers are going to have a, a, lot, a lot of, you know, HR and human capital challenges that they haven't had to have for the last three years. And probably, you know, th their success metrics are going to be evolving very, very quickly. And, you know, it, the, the pressure is going to be on, on current vendors to keep up with what those enhanced or changing metrics are. And opportunistically, if you're a vendor and you want to win the business of a, of a dealer that you don't have today, it's really being able to get inside their head and understanding how those needs are going to evolve very quickly over the next five years. It, it can be pretty clear, I think, that the environment we're moving into, but I think you need to stay a couple of steps ahead if you want to win a dealer's business because it is a cluttered landscape. The, the, you know, the employees at dealerships are overwhelmed. They've got far too many browser tabs open already. And you know, de dealers have become very numb. In my experience, dealers have become very numb to the pitches of new vendors, unless you have like a, a breakthrough aha moment where you can help them achieve one of the metrics that aren't being achieved, frankly, from their existing vendors. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that if I yeah. could. Uh, because you said something very important. The dealer needs to focus on the tech stack. I mean, the customer, they care about a great product and a great retail experience, service experience, and we do that best. And we're hearing from the OEMs, they want to replicate some of what's happening with the direct model about a single tech stack. So you could, you could envision a multi-franchise dealers almost going back to the 90s having different tech stacks for each manufacturer. That's not efficient. And you, know, you could go down a laundry list. When the manufacturer tries to do retail, they don't do it right. They need to leave that with the experts and we need the vendors to, to provide that expertise. We, we need each other and we need the OEMs and most of them get it. 
Uh, but you're starting to hear some of this, and that's going down a bad path. And not, not only is it going to be bad for the customer, it's going to be expensive for the dealer. Can I add one more thing? You may add. So, yes. so often we look at our tech stack as to how is it helping us create a great customer experience and making it seamless and quick and more efficient. I think we've got to continue to make adjustments on the associate side to say, how does our tech stack make it easier for our sales teams to be more efficient and effective as when we were talking earlier about how we create those pathways for uh, better financial situations. Right now our tech stack, even if it does look good to the consumer, is way too complex internally. And too often we're just focused on the consumer side. And data is not moving as efficiently as it should. And NADA is looking into that. Uh, hopefully we'll come up with something that will, we need to take costs out of the system. There's too much cost for the dealer uh, and the vendor to move data around. That, that doesn't make sense. I mean, we've got, we've got to kind of, we're all in this together. That might, might not make everybody happy, but that's what's going to move the business forward because it's got to be seamless. Yeah, Damon, especially as right now a single rooftop looking to expand and, and grow, like the efficiency has to be created sometimes externally for you from vendors because you can't get efficiencies of scale potentially from large corporate you know, efficiencies. What are you calling on your, your partners right now to collaborate with you well so that you can derive great business outcomes? I think for, well, for us, it it's all has to do, deal with relationships. So if my vendor doesn't have a relationship with us to really understand what my challenges are, what my wants and needs are, and what my ultimate goal is, then it's, it tends not to work, right? They're giving, me the, they're giving me the thing that everyone else has, but I need the next big thing, right? And that next big thing needs to be efficient. It needs to be easily to, to operative. And it also needs to be my people to be able to touch that vendor at will to get a quick response at will. So it's, it's a little different for us because I don't have that scale. As I, as I grow, it helps this, this relationships helps, will help me build my scale up and wide. But right now I'm more at the grassroots, hey, how do I get my copier to work type thing? <laughs> or, or, you know, particularly with the DMSs that that continuously to evolve into whatever it's going to be, and, and as Mike you know, just touched on, each manufacturer wants us to have their own respective CRMs. That variety as you grow becomes a challenge, and it's too much too, too, much too soon that it's not efficient and effective. And so for us, I'm trying to use, we're trying to use technology to, to the utmost, but also keeping the people aspect in play as well, because I have an equity amount of customers, a, equity in my customers that my people have to pay attention to. The software or the technology just provides that conduit to make us communicate more, more efficiently. But it all starts with the person. And, and so for, for us, you know, it's, 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 we're gonna be grassroots and we're gonna touch and we're gonna shake hands, we're gonna do as much as we can to provide that value added versus dealing with, with going somewhere else down the street. And so that's what my value add has to be at this point because we all sell the same type of cars I can't compete on a pricing or expensive standpoint like other larger groups, so I have to do a little thing, the little things better than the better, than the larger guys, and so that's really what we focus on. Yeah, uh, Mike, because you mentioned data, um, you know a lot of the newer tech companies that are coming into the space, and I'm sure Steve can agree with this, uh, kind of are built on. Uh, the modern infrastructure of uh, essentially all data is an API, right? Or is connected to an API, either internally or externally. Do you see willingness from legacy providers as well as OEMs to, to enter into that data conversation? I know that the STAR standard is a, is a part of uh, NADA. Do you see that willingness coming? Well, we're working on all of it. <laughs> you know, we're working with STAR. We think we're positioned uniquely. Uh, we don't want to be in the data business, but I think NADA should have an oversight role to make sure that it's being done correctly and efficiently. Uh, so I, all I can say right now is more to come on that. Yeah, good. Uh, Steve, I'll, I'll ask you a question separately on the same, on the same thread, but um, as a dealer, you know, the, the, uh, I remember at least uh, so, some of my friends as I was uh, working in a dealer. <laughs> uh, it kind, of, kind of the conversation was, do you have APIs or is it my data? And those were 
like seemingly good questions, but I think the questions probably need to go a little bit layer deeper to really help the, the, the industry partners understand what the dealer actually needs out of that. How can dealers be best equipped to ask the right questions about the tech stack or the data that the industry partner is holding or, or has access to? Yeah, I, I don't know as a dealer you need to get into that layer of sort of abstraction, theoretical abstraction. I think it's much more practically sharing with the vendors and holding vendors accountable to what you want to accomplish. So as Liza said, you know, if one of the challenges that my associates are finding, you know, the, um, the tools that were provided to be clunky, tr training's an issue as a result of complexity, or, you know, there, there are limitations with how good a consumer experience they can provide because of limitations within the technology, then I think folks like Liza should be challenging her vendors to say, look, you need to step up here, understand what's going on inside my head, what I'm obsessed with this year, and what I'm trying to achieve. And th then the vendors can figure out what, what the data schemas should be and what the API strategy should be. I, I would hope that at the Damon and Liza level, they're, they're not really too worried, I, I could be wrong, but they aren't too worried about API strategies or even understanding what an API is. It's more practically saying, look, um, I have business objectives that I'm trying to achieve, and I hope my, my vendors are helping and not hindering those business objectives. And any vendor that isn't willing to help me uh, improve these business objectives, I'm, I'm going to be shopping for a new vendor. Yeah. Can, I, can I jump in? Because, I, I, look, we've had a lot of problems with Ford over the last 18 months or so. But, but just recently, we're not able to negotiate with a factory, but we're able to work through and react to their new data agreement. And, and dealers need to be very aware of how data is shared with, with their car company. It's the customer's data. It's not the dealer's data, it's not the OEM's data. We're stewards of that information, and we need to make sure that we share it appropriately so that we're in compliance with things like safeguards, but also to move the business forward. And we need, so that's, that's a very important connection. Some of the fa factories are working very closely with us. Others, we're just, we're just not there yet. You know, it's kind of, a, it's, it's mine. And that's mm -hmm. not, that's, you know, again, the customer doesn't care. The customer cares if there's a breach or if there's a bad experience. And we, we, can, we can control that. And we're working on it. I'm stealing that. It's not the dealer's data. It's not the OEM's data. It's not the vendor's data. It's the customer's data. I'm stealing that. Yeah, we're steward. Someone make a shirt out of that, okay? We got a cricket machine back there. We're stewards of the data. Um, Liza, can you point to a, maybe a specific collaboration that you've seen between yourself and maybe an industry partner or, or, or the OEM that has led to great success over the last couple years that you've been able to be a part of to, to support the CMA organization to move it forward? Well, Kyle, my best example actually you were the lead of <laughs> you didn't know I was going to go there I didn't. Um, but, but <laughs> I didn't Steve what Steve was asking about and saying we don't want to know what an API is I don't want to get into that level maybe my marketing team might know a little bit about that but it's certainly not something is going to be in, in Damon and I's uh, normal language uh, but what we one of the best things that we did and that we're still working on this year is when uh, you and our marketing team helped lead to bring all of our all of our major partners of our tech stack and marketing together in one room and talk about what problem are we solving, what problems are each of them partnering with us to solve, how well do they understand our business, making sure they understand what metrics and you know, when, when we have a, a partner who's telling us how many impressions we got in a month but they don't ask us how many cars we sold, there's a disconnect. Mm. And so a year ago, when we brought in that whole group of partners into one room, we understood where we had overlap, where we had gaps. We actually read through what our agreements were with each one so that we had a great grasp of what they were, what problem they were there to solve for us. We still have a lot more work to do on that, but that it goes back to when we go to NADA, when, when we're in rooms with vendors, the first question is, what problem are they solving for us or could solve for us? Not just bring us the next big thing, because sometimes we get overly excited about the next big thing, and it may not actually be something that our group needs. So I think we've gotten much more intentional in the last year. A lot of those partners are here at Asodu, which I think is fantastic because they're like-minded. They also want to make sure that they are true partners and not just vendors to us. I can echo that because you guys have definitely helped helped us try to wean through the contracts and 
the overlap is so key because you wind up double paying or triple paying for the same vendor that just gives you a little scooby snack of what they're supposed to do, but it's not all what they're supposed to do or what they can do. And so we kind of put this one here because we like this and this one here, but wait, this one company does all of that. We need to utilize them, but really understanding what that prospective vendor does as a 360 and what it can do for us is more importantly, or what I can do for them as well. And so it's, you have, um, you guys have definitely helped me decipher and kind of put the pieces to the puzzle together to get rid of some, some pieces that, that don't fit and focus on those things that do fit because that gives value to me. That gives value to my team with some counsel on the, on the end of it. So yeah. it's definitely appreciated. David, I want to uh, trajectory just a little bit uh, because the name conference is coming up in just a couple of weeks and um, and it, I, I want you to give a little bit of background on NAMAD because maybe not everybody in the room is even aware of that organization um, and and then also kind of what that organization is looking at over the next year I know your role is slightly different but you're still very aware there um, and what it's looking at in the minority community in in the dealership world over the next year uh, just in case people aren't aware so, so NAMAD, National Association of Minority Auto Dealers, founded back in 1980. Um, we work closely with NADA as well as AIADA, but the NAMAD goal is, is to increase the number of ethnic minority stores within the U.S., and that's dealerships or rooftops. Um, we work with every manufacturer related to its diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, but we also work with other organizations that are not dealing with diversity as well. So we, we, are, we are good partners to everyone. Um, we have a keen focus on increasing that particular segment. The goal of the association is parity. And what I mean by parity is it's, it's 18,000 car dealerships. Uh, of the minority ranking, there's only 1,400 that are at, owned by ethnic minorities. That's African American, Asian, Latino, Native American. And so there's a 7% representation um, within the dealer body. However, when you look from the consumer standpoint, it's over 30% of all new cars and trucks are owned by or purchased by ethnic minorities. And so that's where the parity comes in. That's the goal of, of, of trying to reach parity as it relates to the buying power of the, of the consumer. Um, and then we, we, the NAMAC conference is next month, October uh, 10th through the 13th. I am the retired, retired. <laughs> <laughs> retired, <laughs> retired president. Um, I'm currently vice chair of the board and become chairman um, next year. And, and our conference focus is similar to what the NADA is. Um, we do have vendors, we have workshops, but it's more of a networking um, opportunity with, with, with our dealer uh, members as well as non-members that all come. Some of you are, are, are actually vendor partners for us as well. Um, but the goal is we're all auto. We all serve as Mr. and Mrs. Customer. No matter whether you're 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 a minority or a non-minority, we serve we we are all the now fraternity slash sorority together to benefit the consumer to make sure that they are happy when they drive off our our, our lots. And so, um, the organization does have a, a legislative push as well or regulatory push in concert with with NADA and as well as AIADA. Um, EVs and affordability is very key as I've been pretty outspoken with it. Um, and I, I will add just, we're taking something that's a luxury vehicle and making it essential. And the, the, that delta in the price don't work. So there's an affordability problem. And there's an access problem. And, and members of Congress and within the, at the federal level as well as the state don't get it. Most of them don't even drive an EV. <laughs> but it, it, is, it is a challenge to get them to understand it because there's a huge dynamic that they're not figuring in that everyone doesn't have a drive, a, drive, a, a driveway, or everyone doesn't have a, a garage. Um, and those things aren't being factored in if it's now the essential vehicle, right? And then if you don't have the incentive on top of that incentive, that, that essential vehicle, then what are we going to do to get to that 67%? You can't. So they're looking at a model that doesn't have dealer bodies, that doesn't have a dealer body that he can change his price at will. And it's an unfair fair advantage that that, that company looks at, that, that they look at to see that's how things need to be done. And so we're all here to advocate that 
you know, we're all in for eight EVs, as Liza mentioned, but uh, we need to make sure that we're, we're cognizant of all those challenges and recognize, the, the, recognize those challenges as well. Yeah, just w we're to, to follow up with, with what Damon said. We are committed, as I said before. Dealers are doing their part. But we're running out of early adopters. And I just reread this old business book called Crossing the Chasm. There, there is a gap now. And to get to the mass market, we need to think of things differently. And your lawmakers have very difficult jobs. They're supposed to know, really, they're supposed to know something about everything. And unfortunately, a few of them think they know everything about everything, but most of them really don't. They need to be educated. And we need to talk about solutions. Because as I mentioned before, if we don't, we're going to get stuck. The dealers are going to get stuck with, with the inventory, and then we're going to have to over-incentivize. It's just, it's, we've all been here long enough to know that, that this, this kind of vicious cycle is, is, is headed our way. So we've got to try and get in front of it. Too far, too fast has been our messaging with EPA. Steve, I'm going to uh, end with you, and, and we are going to look a little bit further out. Because of your influence in the industry and even more broadly, you get the opportunity to not just speak in the U.S., but uh, elsewhere uh, around the world or talk to people in, in Europe and, and all over the place. Um, what, what challenges are you seeing and hearing uh, those that are maybe not local to this group um, that may either be coming down the pipe or we can learn from right now? Yeah, so um, we haven't really talked about sort of this idea of unbundling features in the vehicle and then having consumers, trying to convince consumers to pay for them by the month. I imagine Mike has a point of view on this as well. Um, I, I differ from some out there. I mean, usually the, the reaction is, it's like a, an immediate visceral reaction, a ne negative visceral reaction that, hey, if you're going to build features into the car, you'd better give them to me when I buy the car up front. Well, I think, you know, that, that, that horse has left the barn or train has left the station, whichever um, metaphor you want to use. M many of us today will look at our monthly credit card receipt and see just how many subscription products come into the house every, every week so or every month. So I, I think um, the interesting thing is, um, I, I love to have the, these conversations with dealers, is think about a future where the, the window sticker effectively has features that have been activated at point of purchase and a bunch of features that have been built in but haven't been activated at point of purchase. And, and then what happens when your, your used car manager is appraising a vehicle in three years and doesn't know which of the features have been toggled on and when the consumer trades in that vehicle and goes home at night and cancels 10, 10 of those features on their credit card, that car is going to look very different tomorrow than it does today. There's going to be huge impacts on the auctions, huge impacts on dealers taking in appraisals for off-brand vehicles. And I think that there need to be like new data products and companies that get built as clearinghouses to understand, when I look at a VIN number, which features have been active and which ones aren't active. And this is happening today, especially with EVs. EVs are driving it, but it's not only around EVs. You know, you in the future are going to be able to select what range you want on your vehicle, how much horsepower and torque you want on the vehicle um, at the point of purchase or subsequent. And, and that the question will be then, which again comes back to some of sort of the things I'm sure that keep Mike up at night, is like if, if, if Liza or Damon sell a consumer a vehicle and six months later they get a notification on their dash to say, hey, you know, for $5 a month you can unlock additional horsepower, the dealer may or may not ever be made aware that the consumer activated that feature. And now we have a consumer coming into the service bay saying, hey, I activated these features and they're not really working out. And you know, there's going to be more coupled uh, uh, communication between the automaker and the dealer, not to mention what the revenue share should be on these features if the automaker is successful in having the consumer subscribe to these features. So it's, it's a kind of a brave new world. It's very exciting because there are these new revenue pockets and you could almost see new, new departments within dealerships that may be responsible for managing all those subscription products that consumers are paying for. But there's a lot of uncertainty right now, which uncertainty can create anxiety because we don't know exactly how this is going to play out. So I feel like I was called out on a debate. 
stage, so I get just 30 seconds to respond. <laughs> um, we'll take it. Counterpoint, counterpoint. Well, counterpoint, well, counterpoint. well, what we can have, Steve, and I think you would agree with this, we can't have our, our dealers selling loss leaders, then the manufacturer flashing those cars with high margin upgrades, and then the manufacturer having that one-to-one -one relationship. NADA has been very clear on this point. We can't negotiate for an industry, but we have encouraged dealer councils to make sure that dealers have a share. They've got to earn that share, but they should have a share in that revenue stream. And we need to make sure that we are focused on, on the customer, again, as, as, as an ecosystem, as a manufacturer-dealer ecosystem. Gone are the days where you make them, we sell them. We've got to figure out how to share data and do all of these things by putting the customer first. But we've seen some factories try and try and run an end around, and we've got to make sure that, that that doesn't happen. Several states have put legislation in. I don't know if that's the right the right course, but but we it's a very very important topic of conversation, and uh, I just want the dealers to know in the room we, we've got your back on this. We've brought it up through our guiding principles, and we're having those conversations with with all the manufacturers. Mike, I think the the one point you just said there are a couple states that have legislation. Legislation is never the answer that will save us, but it does create a pause so that we can be a part of the conversation and help find a collaborative solution. And that's what our role has to be. You guys can help get the pause in there. And so can our states, and then it's up to us. Uh, look, I couldn't, did you plan that to like put that into the whole collaboration critical? You were just like, boom, right there. That's great. Um, hey, I want to thank you all uh, so much for giving uh, of your time and, and just talking through what you're seeing, what you're hearing. Uh, can we give it up uh, for our first panel?